Just as politicians of all stripes had buried their differences to fight the common enemy on the outbreak of war, so too had a truce been declared between women and men. After years of escalating militancy in the battle for women's voting rights, the leaders of the suffragists and suffragettes had put aside their demands immediately when war began. Millicent Fawcett, president of the non-militant National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, NUWSS, had led the way by calling on her supporters, the suffragists, to offer their services to their country. Women, your country needs you, she exhorted her members within days of war being declared, even before Kitchener's iconic poster made the same appeal to men. Emmeline Pankhurst, the steely matriarch of the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU, had followed her example a few days later, urging her militant members, the suffragettes, to suspend all activism and divert their energies and organizational skills into supporting the war effort. In return, the government had announced an amnesty and released all suffragettes from prison, some several hundred women, within a week of declaring war. Although some stalwarts of the women's movement had joined pacifist campaigns, most women threw themselves into the new cause in a rush of patriotic fervor. One group of suffragettes had already launched the Women's Emergency Corps to recruit women into jobs vacated by men who were now enlisting. Women had flocked to its headquarters to volunteer as drivers and motorcycle dispatch riders or to run soup kitchens and refugee shelters. Aristocratic women and society ladies, until recently some of the loudest voices demanding the vote, were now offering their homes in London as convalescent hospitals for the wounded and raising funds to send medical units to France. And women everywhere, whether they identified themselves as suffragists or not, were signing up to play their part as volunteers at home and overseas. Louisa Garrett Anderson and Flora Murray, who were waiting to board their train at Victoria that morning, had been among the first to recognize the unique opportunity that war presented to women. They knew that war with Germany posed a terrifying threat to Britain, but it also offered a once-in-a-lifetime chance for women. Both Anderson and Murray were qualified doctors of many years' standing. Anderson, 41, was a surgeon, and Murray, four years older, a physician and anesthetist. Yet despite the fact that each woman had more than ten years of experience in her chosen profession, neither had enjoyed a significant spell of work in a major general hospital. Hospital boards were almost entirely controlled by men, and women doctors were effectively excluded from training or working in mainstream hospitals or attaining high-status medical positions. Women were likewise barred from becoming army doctors regardless of the current need. Although their medical qualifications were exactly equivalent to those of their male colleagues, Murray and Anderson had been restricted to treating women and children. Through necessity as much as desire, they had worked in hospitals run by women for the treatment of women and children alone. War had changed everything. Despite their complete lack of experience in treating men or in dealing with war injuries, the two women had decided to set up their own emergency hospital to treat wounded soldiers plucked from the battlefields in France. Gathering together a team of young recruits, including three more women doctors, eight nurses, three women orderlies, and four male helpers, they were bound for Paris. It was a gamble. They were not only heading for unknown dangers in a war zone with 18 young people under their command, but their medical inexperience meant they were seriously unprepared for the challenges ahead. Both, however, were as committed to the women's cause as they were to each other. They saw the unfolding drama in France as their first chance to prove that women doctors were equal to men.